the law man and the seals. Could you tell us how many people you killed? About 36 people. We broke in there and we find one, I shoot him. There was a dish next to the house and I buried them. Why would they have proper burial? There. Let the worm eat them. Jose Manuel Martinez has lived a life that will send shivers down the spine of even the most hardened criminals. In his hands lie the death of over 30 men. Carrying out the evil deeds of some of the most brutal cartel leaders, Jose took lives like they meant nothing. He reigned so much terror in several counties across the United States that he earned the nickname El Mano Negra, the Black Hand. This is the life of the most dangerous cartel hitman ever. You can't imagine what people have told me when they hired me to go and kill a person for them. After I get paid, they told me, you know what, Martinez? I feel a, lie, a weight has lifted from my heart. Life for Jose Manuel Martinez started out very normal. He was born in 1962 in Tulare County, California, to farm worker parents from Mexico. Nestled in the heart of California's Central Valley, where the jagged peaks of the Sierra Nevada mountains cast long shadows on the landscape, Tulare County is a place that seems to have paused in time, unaffected by any development of the 21st century. It's as if time here moves to a different beat. Tulare County seems to have been forgotten in the 20th century and is now struggling to play catch up with the rest of civilization. In these rural stretches, getting a deep Decent cell phone signal is a challenge, with very little to no social life anywhere around the county. The only thing that seems to work in this remote corner of California is agriculture. Life in Tulare revolves around planting and harvests, as nearly 40% of the nation's fruits and nuts are grown here. Counties like Tulare may have begun as optimistic centers of commerce, with banks and stores, but left abandoned, they soon faded into isolated, dusty settlements, leaving behind remote communities that are basically makeshift homes for migrant laborers. In Tulare, traffic lights are rare and grocery stores can be a long drive away. Access to safe drinking water can also be a pressing issue, but no sooner had Jose learned to walk, his parents moved the family to Sinaloa, Mexico, a state often known as the narco capital of the world. The move would come to define Jose's journey into a life of crime. After I learned to walk and talk, we moved to Cozala, Sinaloa, mm -hmm. okay? Jose and his siblings spent part of their childhood in Mexico, near the town of Cozala, in the remote, cool mist of the Sierra Madre, the mountain range that runs through the state of Sinaloa. The state of Sinaloa has long been a center for contraband in Mexico, as well as a home for poppy cultivation. Nearly all of the trafficking organizations in Mexico have their origins in this region, and one of the biggest cartels in the world, called Sinaloa, its home. The most powerful is the Sinaloa cartel. Almost the 70% of the world is infected by this cartel. The Sinaloa cartel is often described as the largest and most powerful drug trafficking organization in the Western Hemisphere, and Jose was in the thick of it. Life in Sinaloa for Jose's family was marked by poverty. Though Jose was young at the time, so he didn't know it, he knew there was very little food to eat, but he got to run free in the fields and play with kids his age. Life couldn't have been better for him. Then at the age of 11, his family moved back to California, and that's when the once happy kid began to get a taste of crime. We came back when I was about 11 years old. What do you remember about that? I remember that people were making fun of me because I didn't know how to speak English. Because Jose had moved back to Mexico with his family when he was little, he never got to learn English. So when his family moved back to the U.S., the kids in his class didn't let him forget it. They found the perfect target to torture, and they didn't hold back. Jose felt the brunt of their ridicule every day and desperately prayed his family would move back to Sinaloa where he could be happy again. But he soon realized that wasn't going to happen, and he began plotting his first attempt at revenge. So I told my mom I was going to kick this kid because he said I should go back to Mexico. I came that I don't belong in the United States. Life in California was not much different from life in Sinaloa. Jose's family wasn't well-to-do in the U.S. either. After a while, Jose's family moved to a different town called Erlemart, where they lived in the flat middle of the valley on a ranch. Jose hoped things would be different here and the kids would be kinder, but he wasn't so lucky. And then we moved to Erlemart and the same shit happened. On top of getting bullied, Jose found out that his parents would be separating. 
His parents' separation had a profound impact on Jose in more ways than one. Other than having to get used to his parents not being together, the separation marked the entrance of a figure into Jose's life. This figure would change the course of his life forever. Two months later, my mom got a new boyfriend. <laughs> That's your step. That's Pedro. Pedro Fernandez. Jose's mom met Pedro Fernandez and married him almost immediately. Pedro Fernandez was described as a good man who cared for his family and protected them as fiercely as possible. No one dared to mess with Pedro and his family. There was only one problem. My stepdad was a dealer. Jose's mother and stepfather managed housing for migrant farm workers. Pedro helped line up work for crews for grape growers, but he was also a businessman, as Jose put it. That business was heroin. Living with a narcotics dealer marked the beginning of Jose's descent into a life of crime and violence. Before Jose was even out of middle school, Pedro tapped him to run the illicit substance. As a bilingual American-born teenager, Jose could move between worlds and escape law enforcement's radar. In the spring of 1976, Jose graduated middle school and his stepfather decided to test his loyalty. On what was supposed to be his graduation day, Jose was sent on the Greyhound bus to Indio to pick up a package. Now, although Jose knew his stepfather was mixed up in the narco world, he was about to find out just how deep his ties ran. When he met up with the guy he was supposed to pick up the package from and handed the package, Jose was curious about what was in it. When I picked up the package, I asked the guy what was in it. He told me it was heroin. I was a kid. I didn't know much about it. Jose was shocked, but he quickly recovered and took the package home. His stepfather was so impressed with him that he decided to send him on more errands. Once he was firmly introduced to the narco world, Jose was running errands in and out of their small town of Erlemart. He soon got a car, which allowed him to move the substance more easily. But in September 1978, Jose's life as he knew it changed. The Drug Enforcement Administration raided the ranch where Martinez lived, seizing $2.5 million worth of narcotics and several firearms. My stepdad got busted on 78. Okay, I started selling drugs and I was 16 years old. His stepfather was sent to Lompoc Federal Prison, but after a few years, he was released, and Jose noted that he was happy and resumed living his life like nothing had happened. This would give Jose confidence as he moved through the underbelly of crime. But a year after that, tragedy struck the Martinez household, forcing Jose to transition from a life of crime into something much more sinister. At that time, that's when my sister got murdered. He says here, nice place to bury fuckers. Jose grew up quite close to his family. While he had embarked on a life of crime, his family was very important to him, and he took their protection very seriously, especially after his stepfather went to jail. He was particularly close to his little sister, Cecilia Martinez. Growing up together in Sinaloa and then California, Jose always looked out for Cecilia, making sure she was taking school very seriously and surrounding herself with the right people. And although at that point his family had expanded to include a wife and a child, he was still very close to Cecilia and his mom and would constantly check in on them. But in 1978, the Martinez family experienced a tragedy so chilling, it changed all of their lives forever and set Jose on a path of destruction, a path from which he never looked back. They went and told me, hey bro, can you take me to India to meet this guy? I said, sure sister, why not? And I took my sister to this little house. Jose took his sister to her friend's house as she requested, dropped her off, and drove away. He never went in to make sure she was okay. Because she was at a friend's house, Jose thought she would be fine. Little did he know, that was the last time he would ever see his little sister. Okay, mom's pressed by, and she never came home. At this point, Jose knew something had gone terribly wrong. It was very unlike his sister to be away from home for months on end. He and his family went to the authorities to report Cecilia missing, and within a few weeks, the authorities came back with news. Unfortunately, for Jose and his family, it was devastating news. First, they found their car. After authorities found Cecilia's car, Jose knew it couldn't be good news. There was a very good chance that she had been taken from them. He prepared himself for the day that would confirm his biggest fear, and before long, he heard knocks on his door that set in motion the spine-chilling events. And then they found her her body had been dumped near Bombay Beach, at the edge of the Salton Sea, the vast, eerie lake that straddles Imperial and Riverside counties. The Martinez family was shattered, Jose more than anyone, 
because he had been the one to drive her to the house, from which she never returned. He blamed himself and knew he needed to make it right. He started putting a plan to avenge his sister's senseless killing into motion. Jose knew he would be invited to give a statement soon because he was the last person to have seen Cecilia alive. He also knew that if he told the authorities exactly what happened, there was a chance the people who hurt Cecilia would be caught and sentenced to prison. But that wasn't enough for him. I made a statement because I was the last one who saw her. I didn't want to give the full explanation because I want to get them. I didn't want the cops to find them. I want to find them myself. He wanted them to feel the pain he and his family felt when they were told Cecilia had been taken away from them. He wanted to defend his sister's honor, and he felt the only way he could do that was to make them pay in his own way. Jose accompanied his distraught mother to the Riverside County Sheriff to make a statement. Unbeknownst to the officers in charge of the case, Jose had left out important details in his statement. Jose immediately began searching for the man that hurt his sister. He enlisted the help of a couple of friends, and before long, they found him. We went to this little house. And when Jose came face to face with his sister's killer, he did not hesitate to exact his revenge. We broke in there, and we find one, I shot him. There was a dish next to the house, and I buried them. Why would they have proper burial? Them. Let the worm eat them. And in that moment, after Cecilia's killers had been dumped in the ditch, Jose became a new man. I was a nice man until they killed my sister. And since then, I said, Fuck the rippers and the child monsters. When my father was in the funeral, I told my dad, I'm going to get those monsters. He said, Son, let God take care of them. I said, Dad, God ain't going to do shit. Jose did not feel shame or guilt after doing what he did. He felt pride. I feel so proud. It was, I don't know, you feel good. You feel something relax in your heart when you take revenge. Jose began his foray into the dark path with confidence. Seeking revenge had switched off something in him, and he was now capable of anything. But no matter how many lives he ended on his path, he never forgot the first lives he took, and he never forgot what taking those lives meant for him and his family. And even as his murderous rampage came to an end, and he confessed his deeds to the authorities. He never told anyone the location of those three bodies. Those bones, he said, don't deserve to be found. But before that time came, Jose would go on to build a fearsome reputation, striking fear into the hearts of those who heard his name, El Mano Negra. The law man and the CEOs. Jose Martinez wanted to try one last time to live on the straight and narrow. Growing up, he had always wanted to join the Marines. And when he turned 18, he decided to give it a try. He went to Bakersfield to sign up for the Marines. But unfortunately for Jose, he was rejected. But the stupid son of a didn't accept me because I was a ninth grade dropout. Despite the rejection, Jose was determined to become a Marine. So he sought out help from one of his relatives, who was a Marine before becoming a correctional officer. But Jose was again met with rejection. Only this time, by a member of his family. Say I'm the black sheep of the family. Mm -hmm. After the second rejection, Jose was done. He abandoned his dreams of becoming a Marine and with it, his hope of keeping on the straight and narrow. He fully embraced a life of crime. On the fateful morning of October 21st, 1980, an unmistakable sense of doom hung heavy in the air as Jose found himself in the passenger seat of his friend's car. Their destination, the unassuming home of David Badola, a man whose life was about to take a chilling and irreversible turn. As the first rays of dawn filled the lingering darkness, Jose saw David, accompanied by his wife, coming out of their home. The husband and wife, completely unaware of what lay in wait for them, had their day perfectly planned. They had a grueling day of work waiting for them in the vineyards. Although the work was difficult, it was their only means of sustaining their small family. As they drove in the eerie hush of the early morning, Jose's car trailed behind them on the winding country roads. Just a short distance before they reached their destination, David's car came to an abrupt halt as he intended to pick up another vineyard worker. As he waited for the worker to come out of his house, the tension in the car grew palpable. In a heart-stopping moment, the deafening sounds of gunfire shattered the silence, breaking through the quiet morning with a chilling intensity. Jose had fired his weapon. Bullets whizzed past David's wife before piercing the windshield. Jose had missed. 
He steadied his nerves before firing again, and this time, he didn't miss. The next set of bullets hit David's head, sealing his tragic fate. David lost control of the car and it careened uncontrollably off the road, crashing into the vineyard. David's life was taken in an instant, his dreams and aspirations forever silenced. The harrowing question that loomed was, what could have driven Jose to commit this heinous act? The answer lay in the shocking events that had unfolded only a few hours before, as he and a friend aimlessly whiled away their time, drinking the day away. Their casual conversation took a sinister turn, revealing a tale of unimaginable horror. Jose's friend disclosed a bone-chilling secret. His friend informed him out of nowhere that his family had suffered a recent tragedy. His sister had been recently attacked. The revelation sent shivers coursing down Jose's spine, taking him back in an instant to the moment he found out his own sister had been attacked. His friend revealed his dark intentions to him. He wanted to hurt the man who had hurt his sister. He told Jose that his sister had been attacked in Mexico, and he had followed her attacker to California, to the town of Lindsay. The attacker seemed to be living an ordinary life with his wife and young son. This revelation shocked Jose and awakened in him a monster he was desperately trying to put to bed. Despite being only 18 years old, with a family of his own, Jose didn't hesitate to act. I told him I could help him for $500. I felt angry when I heard the word abuse, and $500 were handy. Point and shoot, easy money. On that eerie morning, as violence lurked in the shadows, Jose fired his weapon, taking David Bedola's life and inflicting the punishment he thought was due. Jose was irrevocably drawn into its chilling embrace, and El Mano Negra was born. Jose began his journey as the cold-blooded killer El Mano Negra in September 1982. But before that, in June 1979, in the remote town of La Cofradia, nestled deep within the formidable Sierra Madres, an incident took place that found its way back to Jose Martinez in California. On that fateful day, an unsettling feeling hung in the air as roughly 50 people gathered for a seemingly innocent party. This event took place at the home of a man who often shuttled between Mexico and the agricultural towns of Central California. But on that day, the event was taking place in La Cofradia, a small town that looked like it belonged in the previous century. A stark contrast to bustling cities and isolated from the convenience of modern amenities. It was a place where people moved around on horses, yet beneath the surface of the tranquil town, a dark current flowed as the drug trade gained popularity and became important to the economy. As the sun set and the night came, the group of 50 partied the night away. But as the party was winding down, a fight over who was dancing with who ensued, and the entire event took a drastic turn. In the shadows, hidden firearms were drawn, and before the night could draw to a close, four lives were tragically ended. The aftermath of this horrific event was swift, the families of the dead, united by a shared grief, swearing to exact their revenge. Now fast forward to September 1982, and we find Jose in the quiet town of Erlemart on an ordinary day that would soon be marked by a chilling revelation. A friend, known only as Mr. X, paid Jose a visit, carrying with him grim information that would unleash the wrath of El Mano Negra. Mr. X told Jose that one of the individuals killed in the tragic 1979 fight was, in fact, a relative of Martinez. The chilling revelation didn't end there. Mr. X told an even more sinister secret. Two of the perpetrators had sought refuge in California, believing they could hide in Santa Barbara County where no one knew them or so they thought. Armed with this information, Jose began his journey of revenge once again. On October 1st, 1982, Jose, accompanied by three friends, left their home in Kern County, situated in the heart of the Central Valley. Their destination, the serene town of Santa Inez. Here, amidst the quiet fields, Jose's relentless quest for vengeance would reach its chilling height. Suspense hung in the air propelling them toward a confrontation that would alter the course of their lives. Jose found the man he had been told to look for driving a tractor. He opened fire. Mr. X gave me $2,500. I really didn't want the money. I wanted to be like the same level he was. I wanted to show him what I'm capable of doing. Little did anyone know the pivotal role Mr. X would play in Jose's life. Mr. X gave Jose a pager, and he was in business. The sinister business of a cartel hitman. I guess you got the right to remain silent. Everything that you say will be against you in court of law. You cannot hire a court. <laughs> okay. I say that to one guy, Owen Penn. Okay. And, uh, are you in a cop? Yes, I'm from Atlanta. Please, you come. 
Jose found himself at the heart of a cartel dispute two weeks later when his pager rang. The message displayed on the tiny screen revealed that Mr. X was in a delicate situation and needed his help with a man who owed him a whopping $95,000. Jose moved quickly, intrigued by the path he was on. By midnight, Jose was in his car, speeding north on Highway 99. He found the debtor and brought him to an empty garage, torturing and threatening him telling him he was worth the same to him dead or alive. He then gave him a few hours to come up with the money. In no time, the man coughed up the money he owed, and Jose drove straight back to Mr. X to deliver it. For his first job as a Sicario, Mr. X paid him $30,000. Some of Jose's work as a Sicario included threatening and torturing men who owed cartel bosses money in the US, and Jose was good at his job. He had steady nerves that served him well, even in the most stressful situations. One such stressful situation came when he was pulled over by an officer on his way back from a job. Jose knew he had to play it cool, otherwise the officer would search his car and find several weapons a lot of cash, and all manners of illegal substances. The officer told him he was going to bring in the dogs to search the car, and Jose, with a smile on his face, calmly offered to help him search. Seeing Jose so at ease, the officer decided to skip the search. If the dogs had come, Martinez said, they would have found his illegal loot. The more jobs Jose was given, the better he got at it. To be the best hitman he could be for the cartels, Jose taught himself how to take people's lives efficiently by watching a lot of assassin movies, like the Rambo series. The first thing is not to get nervous and don't leave evidence. Be patient. Jose was not only a good cartel hitman, he was different. He would sometimes commit random acts of violence that had nothing to do with the cartel, then attempt to offset it with random acts of kindness, like the time he fired at a man merely for repeatedly parking in his mother's driveway. But in a moment of weakness, Jose secretly returned the man's car to his house just in case his family needed it. After a few days and no one had found the man's body, Jose heard that the man's mother was worried. I heard that his mother was gone crazy. She wanted her son, dead or alive. And I feel sorry for what I did. I say I have a mother too, and I don't want her to be in the same shoes as she is. He decided to retrieve the body from where he left it and took it to a place it would be found by authorities. Weeks passed by and they found the body. But these random acts of violence, followed by kindness, would soon pave the way for his downfall. <laughs> Three weeks after the attack on David Bedola, a witness called in with crucial information that would set the authorities on the heels of El Mano Negra. The witness revealed that the murder had been committed by a man named Jose Martinez. He went on to provide specific details about the attack in a way that only a person who saw the whole thing go down would know. The witness claimed the murder was revenge for an attack that took place during a card game a few months earlier. Officers investigated the tip, but came to a dead end. They could never find any other information that connected Jose to the attack, and the witness was not willing to come forward to testify. The authorities had no choice but to drop the case, something they would find themselves doing several times over a period of years as they tried desperately to catch the Sicario named El Mano Negra. The name Jose Martinez kept coming up in several cases. His name turned up as a source in one murder and as a presence in the events leading up to another. On several occasions, officers thought he could be the one they were looking for, El Mano Negra, but even then, they could never charge him with murder. In September 2009, Jose brutally attacked a man in Erlemart. Within days, the authorities had learned from the victim's friends that a person known as El Mano Negra had been looking for him and threatening to take him out. Luckily for them, they found a woman who said Jose had attempted to hire her to lure the victim to an isolated place. They finally had the connection they'd been looking for between El Mano Negra and Jose Martinez. The officers found out he had an outstanding warrant for a parole violation and possibly another one for auto theft and proceeded to arrest him. They arrested Jose on parole violation, but just before they were able to put him in handcuffs, he swallowed his SIM card so the officers couldn't see his text messages. They tried to replace the SIM card with another one, but the messages were gone. When you're a dumb cop, you're always going to be a dumb cop. Really? Uh, but that is true. Okay. I don't yeah. Know. What should they have done? I mean, what they say is you didn't leave any evidence. Yes, exactly. I never leave evidence. The officers then tried to interrogate Jose, but got nowhere. They asked him if he could explain why everyone in Erlemart believed he was the person who attacked the victim. Jose told them he had no idea why they would think that, and proceeded to inform the officers that everyone in Erlemart was lying. The interview lasted less than an hour, 
and when they couldn't get anything useful out of him, they booked him for the parole violations, and he spent a few months in jail. The murder, however, remained unsolved. Everyone was too scared of Elmano Negra to testify against him, but lucky for them, the end came faster than they thought for Elmano Negra. Jose took a job in Florida. He was to end the life of a man who had stolen from top-ranking cartel members and needed to pay. Jose watched the man for a few days, mapping his routine. When he had all the information he needed, he posed as a homeowner in need of masonry work. You told me that you're a masonry worker and I want you to come so you can give me an estimate price for my house. When the man showed up to bid on the job, Jose took him and forced him to hand over the money he stole, which had been buried in his backyard. They got in, I locked the door. When I turned out, I had my guns out. Motherfucker hit the floor, motherfucker. Then Jose fired at him four times. He put another four bullets into one of his co-workers. Their bodies, wrists bound with zip ties, were left to rot in a Nissan truck parked on a swampy stretch of the road at the edge of the Ocala National Forest. Jose then started the drive to his daughter's home in Alabama. The Florida job had gone without a hitch, or so he thought. It was his granddaughter's birthday. He took her out for a fun day in the sun. I got her, I took her to Toys R Us, okay? Where a kid can be a kid. As he had fun with his family, he didn't realize that he left footprints on the Florida job that would lead the authorities straight to him. Back in Florida, detectives inspecting the victim's truck found a can of Mountain Dew in the center console. They emptied it and found a cigarette butt, which they bagged and tagged into evidence and sent it off to the crime lab for testing. That cigarette butt would come back positive for Jose's fingerprints, setting the stage for his arrest. But when officers brought him in for questioning on why a California man's fingerprints were found on a crime scene in Florida, what they heard was a confession that sent chills down their spine. After Jose was brought in, they told him they had DNA evidence for the Florida murders. The officers expected Jose to stall a little and send them on a wild goose chase. But what he did next shocked them. At that moment, Jose seemed to make a decision. You guys have been real respectful to me, and I appreciate that. Do you want me to tell you the truth? The officers enthusiastically nodded. Yeah, I killed that son of a bitch. Upon further questioning, Jose dropped a shocking bombshell on them. Could you tell us how many people you killed? About 36 people. Jose confessed to over nine murders, giving detailed descriptions of the crime scene and the number of bullets used. He said there were some things in California that he wanted to get off his chest as well. He asked the detectives to help him contact the sheriff's deputy from Tulare County. He confessed to them that he was a cartel hitman. Jose Martinez was arrested and charged with several murders in many counties across the United States. Jose confessed because he was tired of running and constantly looking over his shoulder, and he knew he would not have been able to stop on his own. Once a thief, always a thief. They say once a gangster, always a gangster. Once a killer, always a killer. Jose received several life sentences following his conviction on the nine murders, narrowly escaping the death penalty for the Florida murders. Hey, thanks for watching. What are your thoughts on this story? Do you know of other similar stories? Let me know in a comment. And before you go, make sure you like, subscribe, and hit that bell button. See you next time, and stay safe.